in Europe. Good evening. I'd like to start the meeting with a call to order and we'll start with a roll call vote of members. Bill. Yes. John. Here. Carol. I think you're muted, Carol. <laughs> okay, there we go. Hi, here. Thank you. Wendy. Heather. Here. Cliff. I know Cliff is here with audio. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Laura Lee. I know Laurie Lee was here a minute ago, so I'm sure she'll be back. Um, I don't believe Jim is joining us tonight. Yes, I'm here, Jim. Oh, hi, Jim. Sorry, hi. do you prefer Jim or James? Jim's fine, thanks. Okay, hi, thanks. And myself. Okay, and we have, um, I'm happy to say, one of our Irving reps is joining us tonight. Jennifer Eichhorn is here. Hi, Jennifer. Hi there, how are you? Good, I'm glad you could join us. Thanks for having me, appreciate it. Yes, yes that's great. Okay, now I have to read all the official information here for the meeting. Per Governor Baker's order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 20, the public will not be allowed to physically access the school committee meeting. Members of the public can access the meeting via Montague Community Television Broadcast. The extension of the emergency open meeting law provisions were signed into law as Chapter 20, Section 20 of the Acts of 2021. The school committee reserves the right to implement additional remote participation procedures and will notify the public of these procedures as it is practical to. The option for public bodies to hold meetings remotely until March 31st, 2025 has been signed into law by Governor Healy as Chapter 2 of the acts of 2023. Any members of the public who wish to join the meeting may do so by accessing the link to be found on the GMRSD website. It can be found under school committee notices and agendas for upcoming meetings and it will have tonight's date. Jane, can I um, just comment that John Erminger is here also and he was not named. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I miss you, John? Thank you, Bill. Thank you. I can't hear you, John. That's Oh, okay. I, I, okay, I, good. I think I did say here, but... Okay, uh, thank you. I guess I missed it. Thank you, though. I appreciate it, Bill. Thank you. Um, we are also live streaming as well as broadcasting on MCTV, and a recording of the meeting will be available on MCTV and the district website. If you are in the Zoom audience, please keep your camera and the microphone off. Thank you. We'd like to welcome any visitors who are in the Zoom audience this evening. We've not received any requests for public participation, but if we had, this would be the time for someone to take that opportunity. And since we haven't, we will move on to upcoming and school committee attendance at events. Brian? So far, still nothing new. I'm not sure if anybody has anything to add, but um, the summer food programs will continue through August 8th. Um, not this. I'm sorry. Not the summer food programs, but the um, summer programs, summer school programs will continue through August 8th. New teacher orientation will be held on Friday, August 23rd. Monday, August 26th is the first day of school for staff, and Thursday, August 29th is the first day of school for students in grades one through 12. Do any school committee members have anything else to offer? Not as likely in the summer, I'm sure. Thank you. Um, superintendent's report. I don't believe, do you have one this evening, Brian? I don't have one this evening. No, since you're officially on vacation, you can. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Um, business and operations, Joanne. Okay, here I am. So I just wanted to give a brief summary of where we are with the budget for fiscal 24 and just talk a little bit about fiscal 25 because I know there's still a lot of confusion about the budget and how that works. So 
We are still working on closing out fiscal 24. You have four cleanup warrants in your packet for approval today. Any purchase orders that weren't completed, you know, for instance, we might have ordered supplies and the supplies were not received yet. Then those purchase orders get rolled into fiscal 25 and we're able to spend the 24 funds later. So we'll spend those down over the course of the summer, but we'll be able to close out fiscal 24 based on what we know on the purchase orders. So in fiscal 25, I know that there's been a lot of things during public comment or, you know, out in the community that we've heard about the budget. And I, I just feel like maybe there's still some confusion about the budget and how that has worked. So, you know, every year we try to build a responsible budget. Together we do that. And, you know, it may not meet everyone's needs. Like, you know, people may not be happy about the budget, but we do what we can with the finances that we have and we do it to the best ability that we have to meet the needs of the students. So, you know, we have to acknowledge that some, there's some local concerns about the budget, but I think some of them are referred to understaffing of the budget, but what it is is understaffing in the buildings. It's not because we didn't budget for positions, it's because we hadn't been able to fill positions in the past. So with the staffing concerns, you know, we've had the negotiations for unit A and unit C made it hard to fill positions. You know, people were leaving and it was just a really difficult time. And without the new contract, we couldn't fill positions because people couldn't wouldn't come to work for us at the lower rates. We really needed the new contract at the higher rates to be able to hire people. So once that happened, you know, the year was half over and we still tried to fill these positions, but there were vacancies all year. People are absent sometimes, so we have absences. And then it's hard to get subs. And so all of those things lead to looking like, they all lead to it looking like we're understaffed, but we're not understaffed because of the budget. We're understaffed because of the staffing. So we're working really hard to fill those vacancies, to build our sub pool, and, you know, we hope to monitor absenteeism and, you know, have a really great year. Another one of the concerns that I've heard is class size. And, you know, we had that elimination of the fourth grade teacher and the paras in first grade. So I have a class size chart there for you on my report. And these are our estimates right now for fiscal 25. So our estimated kindergarten for fiscal 25 at Hillcrest is, is pretty large. It's one of our larger classes. So our class sizes are estimated to be at about 20 students per class. But in kindergarten, we have the kindergarten paras there. And then in first grade, our estimated class size is at 14, right? So much smaller, but no paras in first grade. Although at Hillcrest, we do have about 20 paras among all of those classes for IEP needs. At Sheffield, you can see the class sizes for grade two will be 17, for grade three will be 23, for grade four will be 21, and grade five is 16, right? And so it's grade four that we had that elimination of the teacher, but even still that class size is smaller than the grade three class size. And then Gill, you know, we can't do a lot with the class size at Gill, but if we're at least trying to be comparable, you know, you can see that grade four, Gill's class is 20 students, right? So it's pretty comparable to the number of students that'll be in grade four at Sheffield where we did eliminate that teacher. Now, when we look to fiscal 26 and we know that there's a large kindergarten class, we're gonna have to look at putting first grade pairs back because that's a large class again. So that's something that we'll have to talk about. That bubble teacher, you know, that, that grade four, bubble of a small class is a bubble. And so that is gonna move. And so the number of teachers in each of those grade levels will move with the smaller class. 
So it's not like the third graders are going to go into fourth grade next year and they're only going to have two teachers among them, right? They'll have the three. The two teachers will be in probably in fifth grade where that smaller bubble is. So another issue I heard is that people would like to see the year end balance or surplus used to support the fiscal 25 budget. And so we've we've already done that, right? When we were building the fiscal 25 budget, we talked about the anticipated surplus in fiscal 24, which allowed us to use more E&D than we typically use. So you can see our E&D in fiscal 23, we used 250,000. In fiscal 24, we used 400,000. And in fiscal 25, we used 500,000. We're going to need to start bringing that number back down again, because if we don't have a surplus to put in there to use, then we can't build a budget using that because we're going to hit another a cliff. You know, we're going to come over a cliff if we use too much of the E&D all at once and we don't have anything filling it back up. So, and then I just want to talk a little bit about the budget and how amendments and budget approvals work. So, a regional school district budget is established by a vote of the school committee. Assessments are sent to the towns. The towns have a town meeting. They approve the budget and that finalizes our budget. And that is the budget that we need to operate within for our general fund. So once we've, once we've closed fiscal 24, then we submit our documentation to the Department of Revenue. We get our E&D certified. It's not until after that E&D is certified that we can do anything more with the E&D, right? We can't spend it. We can't have any needs that can be filled with E&D until it's certified at some point after October. But let's say we were to amend the budget. And if we amend the general fund budget, which would be increasing E&D or increasing assessments to the towns, we would have to have a two thirds vote of the school committee to approve that. And then it would go to the towns and they have 45 days to vote it. Even if their assessment is staying the same and all we did is use more E&D, they still need to have a special town meeting and vote that budget. Now, if we, if the change in the budget is in circuit breaker revolving or in um, school choice revolving, something that doesn't increase the overall budget, then it just requires a two thirds vote of the school committee. Maybe we're using more E and D and we're having less Irving tuition you know, whatever those things may be, as long as they balance out and we haven't changed the general fund budget, then we don't need a vote at the town, but we do need a vote of the school committee. And so, you know, from time to time, we bring you transfers to adjust things in the budget. But overall, you know, the budget can't change at this point. So I know, you know, there's, there's people out there talking about changing it, but what we really need to focus on is filling all the vacant positions that we have and there are quite a lot and so we are working hard to do that and getting everything processed so we can have people in place when students return that is all i have for you tonight thank you joanne does anyone have any questions for joanne And anyone who would like to see that information can go to our website and go to tonight's agenda and this um, document will be attached. So anyone's welcome to read it if they'd like to look at it again. Thank you. Next we have school committee reports. We uh, have- Wendy has something to say. I'm sorry, okay, I couldn't see that. Yep. I. We can't hear you. Is your volume all the way up on your computer? I know mine wasn't before. Uh, you're muted now, Wendy. It's coming up as mute.
when it's not muted, there's static somehow. Is there something interfering maybe? I don't know enough about this to be much help. Sometimes if you go out and come back in, it right. helps. Wendy, you probably will have to go out and come back in and reboot the machine. And we'll hold off so uh, Wendy can make her comment. Hi, Wendy, go ahead and try. Jane, while we're waiting, I'd just like to say, I think that the surplus is based on end of year calculations where the um, contribution from E&D is made at the beginning of the year. So the two are, are unrelatable in essence mm -hmm. as it relates to the this year's budget or last year's budget. At least that's how I understand it. Thanks, Bill. So the balance in E&D at any given time, like right now, the balance in E&D is based on the year end balance of fiscal 23 and prior. And when we were building this budget, we knew that we were going to have a surplus in fiscal 24 because our choice and charter numbers had really declined significantly. And so we knew that that was going to replenish the fiscal, the E and D at the end of the year. So we could use five hundred thousand. We were comfortable knowing that money would get replenished when fiscal twenty four ended. So there, it goes into the same pot. It's just replenishing what was twenty five. Thank you. Joanne, Joanne, is it correct to say that it the word surplus is really a misnomer? Because it's not really a surplus. It's money that you 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 sometimes anticipate using for the actual building of the budget. Right. Like when in other words, you spend the money. You know, surplus to me means it kind of sits there and you can use it for whatever you want. But if I'm understanding what you're saying, part of the building of the budget is anticipating how much of that money you can spend in order to put the whole budget together. Is that correct? Right. Yes. So like when we're in, when we're building the budget, I mean, we have to build the budget assuming what we know for school choice and charter, for instance, right? So what do we know is happening in school choice and charter? The expense side and that's an expense that we need to build into the budget those numbers are strictly estimates because the actual mm -hmm. cost of those students is who is attending school during that fiscal year and so right. we've already built a budget for fiscal 25 with choice and charter out anticipation fiscal 25 hasn't even begun yet but we've had a budget 
those numbers in their budgeted for six months now. So fiscal 25 is going to happen and anything could change. People could move, you know, mm -hmm. different different people could be on school choice than were on school choice at the beginning. So we need to anticipate those things. And so there's always a possibility of having a deficit or a surplus and you have to work a deficit and you, you know, but a surplus is okay if it rolls into E and D to replenish the fund that you just took 500,000 out of to right. build the budget. So right. each if you don't year, do that, you, you could end up short. Right. And if we're running, you know, if we're operating fiscal 25's budget and it doesn't look like there's going to be any kind of a surplus, we need to bring that $500,000 down in fiscal 26. We won't be able to use 500,000 from E&D because that'll right. lead to a cliff at the end of fiscal 26. And then in fiscal right. 27, there'll yeah. be nothing, you know, next to nothing left. So we really need to be careful about those balances each year. Right. Thank Can you. you hear me now, Jane? Yes. 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 Okay. Well, I just wanted to clarify about open positions. We have open positions we're going to fill, but the positions in question, i.e. the Paris for the first grade at Hillcrest and the fourth grade teacher at Sheffield are off the table at this point because SBA. they're they're not um, uh, the it, the they're not uh, I don't want to say not necessary but not um, you're correct okay um, there's also been some I, I've gotten some questions about a BCBA for the high school. I don't know if that's happening, but is that included in the positions we're trying to hire for? Just for clarification. That is, that is not something that is budgeted as a position, but we have it in the budget like for contracted services. So if we're able to find a person to fill that position instead of using contracted services, then absolutely we would fill that position. Perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Appreciate that. And thank you, Cheryl. Appreciate it. I mean, Wendy, sorry. <laughs> Reading the name, but all right. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Um, moving on to school committee reports. The first is the Warrant subcommittee met yesterday and we approved the five warrants that are listed and if it's acceptable once i've read them all um, someone could move them as a group and we would approve them the first is fiscal year 24 cleanup warrant the number on that is 3482 dated 6 30 2024 in the amount of 143 dollars 83 cents the next is also a fiscal year 24 cleanup that's an ach meaning bills that are submitted electronically. That's number 3483, also dated 630-2024 in the amount of $44,462.20. The third is another cleanup warrant for fiscal year 24. The number of the warrant is 3484, dated 630-2024 as well, for the amount of $266,925.16. The next is a fiscal year 24 cleanup warrant number 3485. This one is dated 6 28 2024 in the amount of $6,605.97. And the last is a fiscal year 25 accounts payable warrant number 3501, dated 7 24 2024 in the amount of $70,668. 30 cents. I'll entertain a motion to approve those as a group. So moved, Heather. Heather, Heather thank you. Second? No, Second. Seconded. Second. Okay, I think I heard Bill first. And any discussion about the warrants? All the warrants in detail are again contained in our packet and it can be accessed by anyone who would like to read them. If no discussion, we'll take a roll call vote. Bill? Yes. John? Yes. Carol? Yes. Wendy? Put your hand up. Wendy gave a thumb, thumbs up. Okay. Thumbs up. Thank you. Heather? 
Yes. Cliff. See, you can talk that way. I think Cliff's here on audio. Lori Lee. Thank you. Yes, sorry. Thank you. Jim? Yes. And myself, yes. Thank you. Uh, and the policy ask seven. For John, ask for John again. <laughs> I heard John, I didn't hear Cliff. So I think you have the same problem on your computer that Wendy had, your, your microphone in the settings might not be turned up or turned on. Is that mine? No, Cliff. Oh, Cliff, yep. Right, because I think he's still on his phone, probably. Cliff, there's an arrow right beside the microphone where you can select what microphone you can use. Okay, we'll move on. The policy subcommittee work will be discussed during the regular business portion. Um, moving on to the business portion, we need. Okay. Oh, there we go. All right, thank you. Um, we need to appoint the school district physician, and that information is in your packet. <clears throat> What's in the packet is actually uh, just the, the school physician um, job description, what basically what the responsibilities are, but the individual um, is Dean Singer, who's been our school, school district physician for a few years. And um, so I'm requesting that the school committee vote to uh, reappoint Dean Singer to continue as the school district's physician. Okay, I will entertain a motion. So moved. I think that was Lori Lee. Lori Lee, thank you. Second. Second. Uh, that was a tie. Who's first? Maybe <laughs> Carol, are you first? Let's go with you. Lori and right. Carol, thank you. Any other discussion of a reappointing our school physician? I believe Dr. Singer was our physician last year. Was that his first year? No, I think it was. He was during COVID, I remember. Yeah, I, I think his first year was mine. I could yes. be wrong about that, but I, right. I think that the COVID year may have been his first year with the district. That sounds correct. Now By the time to start. Yeah. Hey, I, I, I went, I looked at that document and it, I looked through the list of his responsibilities. And would it, is it accurate then that he's doing that for the stipend of $6,000? Yes, that's a that's approximately what, what what's budgeted. So the consulting is just intermittent. Okay, thank you. So we have a motion. We have a second. Anyone else have any discussion of that? In that case, we'll take a roll call vote. Bill. Yes. John. Yes. Carol. Yes. Wendy. Yes. Thank you. Heather? Yes. Cliff? Yes. Lori Lee? Yes. Jim? Yes. And myself? Yes. Thank you. Um, the next item that we put on uh, will be continued later, but we added in a copy of the current school committee goals, as we mentioned at the previous meeting. Um, I hope everyone will take the time to take a look at them because by later this fall, once the district has um, updated the district goals, um, we will then work on our school committee goals using theirs as a guide. Yes, Heather. 
Are we going to be doing like any sort of workshop to work together through these? That's a good question. I'm wondering what people might like. And can I make a suggestion that we, well, that people look at it to um, so switch from smart goals to fast goals? They're particularly good for organizations because of the transparency and the, um, what's the F? I forgot what F is. Hold on. I have it pulled up here. <laughs> oh, frequently discussed, right? Um, which I think is really important when you have goals um, as a group to check in on them. And I'm not saying we talk about them every week or anything, but I don't know. I just, if you want to look into fast goals, I think that might be a nice little transition. It's not a dramatic change, but I think it's an important conceptual change. Mm -hmm. Heather, could if you, you wanted to share anything with me, I could I could push it out to the committee. Okay. That'd be great. Could you tell me where the fast goals term well, comes from? Um, it's, I believe it's from MIT's Sloan Business School. Um, I, I have, I, don't, I was just looking up goal stuff in general for school committee, um, and that just popped up. So I will send you there their article on it. Because I believe the term SMART goals comes from DESI. It does. it does. And that's why we've used that type. It's not terrible. It just, it does lack reviewing, um, which I don't love. And I really like that there's transparency as well with the others. And so, I mean, it, it's, they're pretty similar. I mean, it, it's very, it talks about specific. It's, it's frequently discussed, ambitious, specific, and transparent. Um, you know, okay. SMART goals has turned into kind of jargony stuff. I don't know how effective they really are. And I think that checking in and making sure we are making strides towards our goals is is pretty important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And if we, do, if, we do, if we do decide to stick with SMART goals, we can determine what we want the reporting structure to look like, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't have to be, you know, twice a year. It, it can be um, a much, much more frequent. So that's an, another option. So I, I agree. It, you know, I think the public wants to know, and you know, we should know. You know, um, what you know, what is happening? How are we moving? Although sometimes it is hard to measure because some of the goals are pretty um, lofty, right? And they're not something that you know, they're not tiny little snippets unless we break the goals down into yearly goals and they're actionable and and very very tight then we could certainly check in. Brian could provide information from us as, as soon as he has information. Thank you. Heather? Also, I so I had been reviewing some past um, learning lunches that went over goal setting for school committee members, and I found mm -hmm. their books. And so, I mean, there are a whole bunch of resources out there with some um sample goals as well from other schools and and it uh, to be honest it looks like sometimes we're biting off <laughs> really big chunks that maybe we can even um distill into something that just turns out being important as far as outcomes and mm -hmm. and key results things like that so yeah. I'll, I'll send i'll send brian a bunch of mm -hmm. stuff and we can pull from desi and we can yeah. yeah. Just think about how we want to go forward. That's all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Why... Anything that you send along, I'll share with the committee. And that's why we put it on a couple of times so people can look at it. We'll look at some other information. And then perhaps by the August meeting, we could discuss whether we want to set aside a portion of a meeting we're already having to just work on that, or do we want to schedule a separate one in the fall? So people could also think on that. Any other discussion on that at this moment? Okay, thank you. Um, the next item is an update on reviewed policies. And this is just information about the new Title I information that's come out, um, I think, Bill's going to give us just a bit of general information about that because we don't have the exact necessary wording to redo our policies, practices, handbooks, et cetera, quite yet. Yes, it's really Title IX we're talking about, not Title I. I'm sorry, yeah, Title IX. And Title IX is in the interest of um, communication. I've 
set this up. Uh, Title IX is generally focused on educational entities, uh, but it's based on <clears throat> Title VI and VII from the Civil Rights Act of 1964, except that those two acts, <clears throat> um, or those two titles, I'm sorry, relate more to simply discrimination due to sex and then discrimination in employment due to sex, whereas <clears throat> Title IX says essentially that no person in the USA shall have on the basis of sex be excluded, I mean, sh shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any educational programs or activities receiving federal financial assistance. Uh, Title IX initially got set up in or started to be formulated in 1970. It was approved in 1972, and <clears throat> specific regulations were signed into law by Gerald Ford in 1975. <clears throat> the two objectives uh, looking at Title IX specifically <clears throat> avoid are to avoid federal funds supporting discriminatory practices in educational programs and individuals effective protection against such practices it was to ensure that male and female students and employees of educational institutions are treated equally it certainly came about and, and most people relate it to activities for women um, trying to bring them up to speed with, and equality with what is given to the men, uh, particularly in our educational institutions, but it also protects employees of those educational institutions. Um, the practices are discrimination based on sex, color, race, religion, or national origin. Over time, considerations of what constitutes such discrimination and harassment have evolved, <clears throat> especially as a result of litigation. So in that vein, most recently in 2019, a decision called the Bostock decision was given by the Supreme Court of the United States in that they addressed homosexual and transgender grievances. Discrimination based on sex includes discrimination based on gender identity and sexual orientation is a summation of what they uh, thought. It is applied equally to intersex persons. This is um, discrimination we're talking about. It is applied equally to intersex persons who are people born with variations of sex characteristics that don't match either male or female bodies where, for example, some people may be born with some organs, but not other organs. So it's hard to, it's certainly a hard situation to deal with. <clears throat> in March of, and the Bostock decision happened in 2019. Uh, it was actually a case in Georgia where uh, uh, someone who declared homosexuality was subsequently fired. And in a couple of related cases, there was a transgender issue who was also fired. So all of those things came to the fore and the uh, because different um, circuit courts ruled differently on the issues, the Supreme Court got it and they ruled in favor of the transgender and the homosexual parties. In March of 2021, a memorandum was issued to federal civil rights offices based on that Bostock decision. <clears throat> and this has led to further delineation of Title IX regulations to be <clears throat> enacted August 1st, 2024, in a couple of weeks from now. The whole doc, the document, the current document, the revised document, they call it an, an amended document, nonetheless, uh, is said to be 1,600 pages. So we have not looked at it. Um, we have yet to see a comprehensive explanation as to where we are 
or need to be. At this time, the district feels we are currently in, in compliance with reg the regulations as we know them today. And lastly, I just want to note that people may wonder how is Title VI and Title IX connected, and they are connected <clears throat> through common sex discrimination jurisprudence. So each one of them um, definitely for, uh, prohibits sexual um, discrimination in whatever form it comes to be. And that ends my dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. That was really helpful. Um, so we are currently waiting. Um, we checked with the um, our law firm, the Dupree Law Firm, and someone there is currently working on appropriate wording because with something new that needs to follow particular guidelines, we do look to them. And when I checked with the office a week or so ago, there was somebody there working on it now. We also would expect MASC, the Mass Association of School Committees, will give us a version of appropriate wording before long. We just don't think it makes a lot of sense to work out our own wording in advance and have to change it. So mm -hmm. we wanted to let people know that we had looked into it. And um, there also have not been the information that's come out even in that large document does not apply to sports yet that they're waiting for. And there are some particular states that are um, pursuing lawsuits against the federal government for this new Title IX work. So there is some there are some things in the works for that. <clears throat> Jane, who is the Title IX coordinator for the district? I did know. Um, I think Brian. Sorry, I walked away from my computer to grab a paper across the uh, across the room. Uh, our Title IX coordinator is our director of people services, Karina Whistler. Okay. Okay. Now, will she be doing <clears throat> training or something for the staff on the changes to the to the regulations? <clears throat> we need to take a look at how. Um, I don't know if it will specifically fall to Karina. Um, it, it'll start in my office once we get the information from the attorneys. The first thing that I'll look to do is um, update the various staff and student handbooks, change the information right. to make sure that we have the correct, the correct language in there uh, in general mm -hmm. when that comes from the attorneys. And then depending upon how different it is, it may be as simple as a summary that we do as part of the convocation days. Um, it may be something okay. that we need to send out and uh, ask principals to do at a staff meeting, depending upon when we get that information. So yeah, if, if, there, if there is substantive changes beyond our existing practices, um, then we'll have to take actions there too. But I, Carol, as you know, from being in Massachusetts, yeah, it you know we're fortunate in, in that um, when I first got to the district, one of the first things we did was to make sure that we had gender gender neutral um, restroom facilities in every building, and so mm -hmm. that was sort of the last step that the district needed to take. But if we were in, so hopefully we're ahead of the curve and simply need to update documentation, and uh, just providing hopefully min minimal information because these uh, the students and staff who fall into these newly added categories have already effectively been protected by Massachusetts law. Yeah, yeah. I would anticipate there might be some f updates on forms and things like that, that the language might be a little different, but nothing major probably since, yeah. since within the last two years, the districts all had to update their, their processes. Yes, and we uh, the information we got also said that there could be wording that might need changes in contracts, but we'll certainly look at that as well once we get the specific wording. Again, I feel we're really up to date, but we'll double check and make sure. Right. Sure. I know the advisories that I was working with, they, they really discussed having a pretty tight reporting uh, process. Um, mm -hmm you know, that, that involves the Title 
nine coordinator and and also looking at situations where if depending on if there is a, a gender particular gender um a need to have more like a, a male a male compliance officer and a female depending on the circumstances so those are all things that i think we will discuss once everything comes in i just was curious what the district's process was now for overseeing title nine because mm -hmm. it's a very litigious law and you know we're, we're just beginning we're just beginning to see the, the beginnings of it and so one of the things that um i want to keep an eye out to it for as well is whether or not there are any changes to you know um who would be the primary investigator uh right. you know, that in every one of those circumstances, because we're such a small district, and fortunately we haven't we haven't had to do it over the last several years, we haven't had to do a Title IX investigation per se. Um, but there, all those roles from the investigator uh, to the decider to the coordinator and, and how those all work are really designed in our district on a case by case basis. So, for example, you know if there is a uh, an issue, potential issue of sexual harassment, depending upon what building it in. Typically, that building administrator is usually the the primary investigator. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm going to keep an eye out for. Is are there any changes to the process, or just the the parameters of those now protected by the title? So, yeah, because you know it gets a little tricky if the if it's a staff member accusing an administrator, right. right? The typical person to do the investigation, it sounds like would be the principal, but that the district has to just be able to pivot yep. and decide, you know, and what, you know, what are the rules? And I don't know if that's going to involve, you know, training um, some specific people that, you know, you might, you know, want to call on um, because I think that it's, it's usually where people get districts get in trouble is in the procedures yep. and not following the procedure. Right. It's not usually, you know, the actual situation itself or, you know, it's just, it's really, it's procedural. Mm -hmm. So yep. we gotta be sure we're tight on that. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. I just want to um, add to that, that in extreme cases, <clears throat> The uh, decider and the investigator and the Title IX coordinator can all be one person, but I'm not sure that that's advisable in any situation. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? So we will be updating that as soon as we get the information and the policy subcommittee is is definitely ready to go ahead and work on it as soon as we see what we need to work on, which ones. Thank you. Uh, the next item, we're going to uh, look at some of the policies we have reviewed. And if Heather doesn't mind going through those for us, it's a second reading of one group and a third reading of the other, which will involve a vote for the third reading. If you click on the links, it should open you right to a spreadsheet on the pink readings tab. Um, the first section of the rest at the second half of section G and H changes are ready for third reading and vote. I mean, we can, and then instead of continuing after that, you can, the um, three D financial policies below the pink line are our second reading. So we're only voting on the G's and H's, but D's are for you to review one last time. Okay. Um, does anyone need any summarizing of that? It's pretty much, again, references that needed to be changed, updated language, some legal references. Um, cross references, things like that. It was very minor, but it was important to get everything up to date. Yes.
Okay, let's look at the second reading first because that's the order that it is in the business part of the meeting. The second reading is just as Heather mentioned, the three Ds which deal with purchasing, purchasing authority, and procurement requirements. Those are just the clarifications so far. And those we will vote on at our next meeting. Third reading of the ones that deal with medical leave, political activities, personnel, a lot of it's basically a personnel area. Anyone have any questions about those? I will then entertain a motion to approve the group of G and H policy. So that was- Lorley. Lorley, yep. Thank you. Lorley. Thank you. Second. And, and second, I believe was Carol, correct? Yep. Any further discussion of that? This is time if someone would like to. No, I don't have a, I just had a process question just uh -huh. so. So um, we're we're using MASC's language. Is that what what we're doing? Yes. Okay. Yes. So okay, because I was going to ask if 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 at any point our legal counsel reviews any changes in policies, but I, I guess I would assume that they they are vetted by legal counsel at MASC. And if we had any question about something, we would, I'm, I'm sure, run it by our attorney, correct? Yes, Heather? Yeah, that's true. Um, this section, however, is things like changing commas, periods. Um, yeah. yeah, student substance. Child to student. Yeah, it, it's very yeah. small, small changes. For yes. most. But yes. you're right, Carol, we do. If there's any question, MASC has a full-time lawyer working on the wording with them. And we also refer to ours if there's anything, as in the case of the new Title IX, which might be right. different. Yeah. We refer those directly to the law. Firm. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. John? Uh, when I opened the second and third reading, it seemed it was the same document. Yep, I keep them in the same place so as not to confuse anybody. You can just see from the dates. Um, okay. I keep it stuck at the top for second, third and vote readings and so you can tell from the dates where we're at with each section but instead of sending you because we're kind of um doing we're at a different stage with different ones i just felt like keeping it all on one page makes it pretty clear so we're just voting on above the pink line today yes and then the columns that you set up with the dates in does help people like me to remember which is which yeah. and where we are that's helpful any other questions or comments Okay, in that case, we have a motion, we have a second. I'll take a roll call vote. Bill? Yes. John? Yes. Carol? Yes. Wendy? Put your thumbs up. Okay, I did see a yes. I got it. Heather? Yes. Cliff? Yes. Thank you, Lori Lee? Yes. Jim? Yes. And myself, yes. Thank you. Um, we do not have any new minutes that we need to approve this evening. If you have agenda requests, uh, just, just a reminder, our next meeting is not until August 20th. And in August, we had decided to just have one meeting. So people wouldn't have quite as many during the summer. But if you have any requests, please send them to Bill, Brian, or myself. And other than that, I think it looks like we can adjourn once we have a motion and a second. So moved. Heather second. moved. And Laurie Lee seconded. Am I right? Sorry. That was Who's me, it? Jane. <laughs> okay, thank you. Wendy? Thank you. Any other discussion of adjournment? I think probably not. That isn't usually a big topic to discuss. <laughs> That's the rules, I have to ask. 
All right. In that case, we'll take a roll call to adjourn. Bill. Yes. John. Yes. Carol. Yes. Wendy. Yes. Heather. Yes. Cliff. Yes. Lori Lee. Yes. Jim. Yes. And myself. Yes. Thank you all. And thank you, Jennifer, for coming this evening. Thank you for having me. Have a good night. Bye. Too. Have a great night. Bye.